More than two-thirds of the Earth's surface is covered by water, and yet the oceans remain our planet's last great frontier. Join me as we go behind closed doors with Sylvia Earle, one of the world's foremost underwater explorers, as she helps to unlock the mysteries of the deep. Legendary oceanographer Sylvia Earle has led more than 50 expeditions, logged more than 6,000 hours under sea, and set numerous diving records. I knew that I had been in places that no human being had been before. Come on, let's go. When you see her walking on the beach, it's hard to believe that this petite 67-year-old grandmother is a fearless adventurer. <laughs> Sylvia Earle is not a household name, but her work has played a vital role in helping to understand the sparkling, vast blue water that dominates our planet. Spend some time with her, and you'll see why colleagues have dubbed Sylvia her deepness, the Sturgeon General, and the Queen of the Deep. I think it would be fair to say that where Jacques Cousteau left off, Sylvia has taken up the mantle of the main spokesperson for the ocean. The best thing about Sylvia Earle is her passion. It's contagious. It's passion for the oceans, the beauty of the ocean. Um, she's been the, the first lady of the ocean. She's been the voice of the ocean for many, many years. Sylvia's expeditions take her around the globe. I was fortunate enough to catch up with her at the Monterey Bay Aquarium, where she's an adjunct scientist. Here I'd get the chance to go behind closed doors and into her world. My journey would include a rare trip under Monterey Bay in a small submersible she uses for research. But first, I wanted to get to know this remarkable pioneer. This is a story I've been wanting to do for a long time. Where did this passion for the sea begin in your childhood? Oh, when I was a little girl, about three years old, I was struck by a wave on a beach in New Jersey. And I got tumbled over, and I thought it was great. I've never recovered. <laughs> I love the ocean. <laughs> and that didn't scare you? A lot of people are scared by that initial impact of the ocean wave. It was more exhilarating than it was frightening. I just, I just thought that was terrific. <laughs> it's not just the ocean but the life in the ocean that captured her imagination from her very first dive. I was absolutely mesmerized, and I still am. Every time I go underwater, it's still just such a kick. I've heard you say before that you are a scientist, and you were meant to be a scientist from the time you were a child, and that you are a scientist first and foremost. What does that mean? It's a compulsion to ask questions. I mean, three-year-olds do it. How? Why? What? When? Where? You know, it's, it's just the nature of little children. And it is the continuing nature of every good scientist I've ever met. They never stop asking questions. So I really think people are more frightened to go down into the ocean than they are to go up into space. Well, there is something to that. I, I had lunch once with Claire Booth Luce, and she said, well, it's very simple, my dear, why people really prefer going up rather than down. She said, heaven is that way, and you know what's in the other direction. <laughs> Sylvia is well acquainted with what's down there. Sylvia passing 500 feet. Right, absolutely okay. In 1979, she shattered records when she donned a special suit and walked untethered on the ocean floor off the coast of Hawaii. At a depth of 1,250 feet, even the smallest problem could have been fatal. I see it. The scariest part of that dive was driving to the submarine on a freeway. <laughs> Once I got to the submarine, in the submarine, going down, it was sheer joy. I was transported down on the nose of a little submarine, the Star II, but once on the bottom, I walked away from the submarine and An was able to... An untethered walk. Was able, not tethered to the surface. I had a little communications line back to the sub. That was with a one-person system that does look like an astronaut suit, but unlike astronauts going, whether it's to the moon or taking walks in space, I was surrounded by life. It was glorious. Oh, this is unbelievable. Look at the first men on the moon. You know, what I feel now. 
Her death-defying two-and-a-half-hour walk in the dark still stands as a giant step for marine scientists. Six years later, she set yet another record for a solo descent to 3,000 feet, piloting a tiny one-person submersible. Nobody's been deeper solo and come back. That's always the key. But what is it like? Because you've said it's like midnight when you get down that deep. It is, but midnight filled with stars. There are bioluminescent creatures. Some 90% of the creatures in the deep sea have some form of making their own light. You can imagine fish running around with flashlights. It's kind of like that. They have lights down their side, sometimes with bacteria that glow in the dark. Many of the jellyfish in the deep sea glow in the dark, even in shallow water. And some fish that have a form of creating their own light. Squids, octopuses. And they're down there, because I always have this picture of that the, the deeper you go, the littler the fish are, this tinier little light. But are there big creatures down there, too? Absolutely, there are big creatures in the deep sea. A giant squid could be 40 feet long. Okay, I'm just getting that visual there. A 40 foot long giant squid when you're down there <laughs> in the midnight dark of the ocean. How is it that that's not scary to you? We're not on their menu. I mean, there's nothing in all of the history of squiddom that has prepared them for terrestrial primates being in their midst. Now they might come and touch us. I've had octopuses reach out with their little tentacles and touch, touch, because they're curious. Now, a human but reaction... But they don't wrap around you or hurt you or bite no. you or sting you? Not only if I am aggressive toward them. Sylvia has found that fish aren't naturally afraid of divers. Most are simply curious. Usually you can get away with getting very close to inexperienced fish. And more often than not, they'll come right up to you. When I say inexperienced fish, those that have not met one of us before. There's an amazing difference. If you go to a coral reef where the spear fishermen have been or where dynamiters have been, they get out of the way. But I've been in places, wild oceans, where I know that I'm the first person to be there underwater. The fish just come up to see you, clouds of them. The little butterfly fish just arise off the reef and surround you and they come by and they look at you like, Hi, what are you, who are you, what are you? In her quest to go where no one has gone before, Sylvia has continually pushed the technical limits of diving, always striving to go farther and deeper. For her, small state-of-the-art submersibles are the answer, so she founded her own company to design and operate them. They not only let scientists dive deeper, but stay longer, her daughter, Liz, is the company's president. Oftentimes, you just run out of time. With a submarine, you can stay down there for five, six, seven hours at a time or longer and really get to know the animals in a particular area. Technology and science come together in National Geographic's Sustainable Seas Expedition. Sylvia heads up the project and is an explorer in residence. The $5 million five-year project is using submersibles to help scientists study our 12 national marine sanctuaries, including Monterey Bay, the country's largest. Behind the closed doors of the little subs, researchers can thoroughly explore these largely unknown national treasures. The machines seat one and are kind of like little sports cars. They're maneuverable and easy to operate like a golf cart. Sylvia jokes that they're simple enough for even a scientist to use. Scientists learn how to be pilots so they can take themselves out into these protected areas. These one-person systems, you don't have to ask anyone. You just trust your feelings, your instincts, your hunches. You go where you want to go without asking somebody else to go left, right, up, down. You just do it. The more we explore the oceans, the more we understand how much we rely on them. They hold 97% of the Earth's water, generating oxygen, soaking up carbon dioxide, and shaping our planet's weather. Sylvia calls them our life support system. If we can understand it, if we can learn how to explore it, we can learn how to protect it. As an ecologist, I think I learned that 
even when I was a little kid, that you take care of these natural systems that take care of us. Next. Going down. A voyage to the bottom of the sea. Oh, look at the, oh look there's look a jelly. That's a moon jelly. jelly. They're such beautiful animals. Behind Closed Doors continues here on a &E. Beautiful from above and spectacular from below, four oceans and 20 seas dominate our blue planet. The deepest spot is seven miles down, deeper than Mount Everest is high. And even with our best technology, most of it remains a mysterious, unexplored world out of reach. That's where renowned diver, scientist, and adventurer Sylvia Earle comes in. Probably 10% of life in the ocean has been cataloged to date. Only 10%? Maybe less than that. We, I mean, really? consider the magnitude of what we don't know, how little we've actually seen. Scientists believe 10 to 30 million species of sea life have yet to be discovered, and Sylvia has spent the best part of 67 years trying to identify and understand those creatures. Meeting Sylvia at the Monterey Bay Aquarium and going with her in a small submersible under the bay was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. She looks at sea life differently from most people. She believes fish have personalities and wants to challenge the way we view them. We look at a school of fish and we say, ah, one sardine is like every other sardine. Uh, you've seen one macro, you've seen them all. That is just not true. Come to this aquarium, look, really look at every fish. If you've looked at a herd of zebra, and you'll see that the stripes on every zebra, they are distinctive. No two faces on any two horses or any two anything are the same, and it's true with fish too. She studies them, but she won't eat them. I've lost my taste for them. I know too much. I mean, I used to joke that I eat no one who, I don't eat anybody I know personally. <laughs> but it, it's gone <laughs> And you know that. these fish personally. Oh, you really do. Yeah, no, there's no question. You get to see them and respect them in their place, in their, as a part of what makes the world go around, not just as something to eat. But for Sylvia, there's more to it than that. We are taking too much wildlife out of the ocean, not just fish, squid, lobsters, crabs, you name it. We are equipped, as no creature has ever been equipped before, to consume the world around us. And there's no place that this is more obvious, more evident than in the sea. The aquarium is home to many of the creatures that live in the Monterey Bay Marine Sanctuary. It encompasses more than 5,300 square miles of rocky shores, kelp forests, and its own underwater version of the Grand Canyon. The best way to explore this underwater wilderness is in one of Sylvia's submersibles. Down and back all on the same day. <laughs> this one would take us on our own expedition to the bottom of the bay. I'd finally get the chance to experience the ocean through the eyes of one of the world's top scientists. This is the Aquarius. This is the little sub. Yeah. And it's a, what, a three-man sub or three-woman sub, excuse yes. me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a nice little machine. Many subs can dive to 1,200 feet. They're not very fast, moving at three knots, about the equivalent of a brisk walking pace but they're quick enough for the scientists conducting research. How long can you stay down in this? Well, it has quite a bit of life support. You have several days. You so can stay down there several days? If you want this? to, yeah. Really? <laughs> the sub is equipped with special lights and cameras so every dive discovery can be documented. It takes a team to prep the submersible and a crane to launch the $750,000 four and a half ton machine. Going down. All 
Okay, well, you, you made it nice and comfy in here. Yeah, well. You get to lie down. You get to lie down on the job. <laughs> <laughs> and nobody complains about that either. After nearly 50 years, each dive is still exciting for Sylvia. And I couldn't wait to begin the adventure. As the Aquarius was eased into the bay, I got my first look at the emerald world below the waves. Everything glowed with a soft green light that hinted at the wonders hidden below. Then the engine revved and I could feel a bit of motion as we headed toward the ocean floor. The light began to change. It felt like we were entering another world. As we reached the bottom, we began moving slowly over the ocean floor. There he is. Hello, little starfish. And I was able to capture it all using the robotic camera. Oh, look at the little crab. Oh, there he is. Check yeah. him out. OK, let me see. This goes. Okay, this is like this. a video game, except it's real. We made our way even deeper. The conditions in the bay vary. Today, visibility was limited to 15 feet. It looked like we were diving in a giant bowl of thin pea soup. It's very green water. Yeah. But this is this is what makes the ocean work, all this rich plankton. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's not a bad thing. thing. Here, it's not a bad thing, no. Oh, look at the little Oh, there's look, a look, jelly. Look. That's a moon That's jelly. jelly. There's such beautiful animals. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's like living lace. Like a little parachute. Mm -hmm. We had seen several in the aquarium, but it was a very different experience being able to watch one swim by just a few feet from the sub. Now, I was in their territory. The Aquarius has enough air to sit on the bottom for 80 hours. In case of emergency, it has a backup life support system. It felt like a safe little cocoon with a 40-inch acrylic window offering a close-up view of this magical underwater world. It looked like we were swimming through a glowing galaxy of drifting, swirling stars. Oh, look at all the glistening things in the water. Sparkle, sparkle. And what is that? Oh, little planktonic creatures. What do these little itty-bitty things eat? One, like an them? one another. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> really? It's an eat or be eaten world out there. <laughs> we reluctantly began making our way back up to the surface through the kelp beds. We had been down for more than two hours, and I felt like a kid wanting to stay just a little longer. Here you go. Whoa! Before I knew it, the crane was dragging us back onto land. I scuba dive, but I've never experienced anything like this. It was a privilege exploring with someone who has such a passion for the creatures that live beneath the waves. All right, I want to go somewhere down deep with you again. Well, you know what they say, there's so many people who want to go onward and upward. I think we should go onward and downward. <laughs> The health of the oceans and our planet will depend on what we do in the coming years. And Sylvia believes that with knowledge comes hope. All the discoveries we've made so far about the ocean are just the merest beginning compared to what is out there yet to be discovered. The greatest era of exploration has just begun. For a &E, I'm Joan London. <laughs>